the thesis about the iPad. I think that's all the introduction she did. So, floor is yours, Alexandra. Thank you very much, uh, Mati. Um, yeah, it's really a great pleasure to be here. Indeed, it is my fifth time, but it's also the first time in quite a few years. So there's a lot of new faces for me, as well as a few people that I have been in conversation with extensively in the past. Um, I called this, and I'm already, I have to admit right away, I'm not actually going to be able to tell you what the everyday life of sonification looks like. Probably doesn't matter because I think you all know a lot about that. Um, and if you exchange stories with each other, you're going to get there too. Um, so indeed, um, um, I've been here before, and I've been here in a very different role, the role of an ethnographer. So basically someone who came with a set of notebooks and pens, trying to frantically soak up everything that was going on and learn as much about the community as I could. Wasn't off to the best start at my very uh, first ICAT that I attended. I managed to lose my uh, first notebook uh, on uh, the pre-conference uh, workshop already, never appeared again. Um, so some valuable notes were lost, but I was able to reconstruct a lot of them from memory. Um, this time I learned my lesson and I just didn't bring any, um, so that should help. Um, so what I was trying to do at ICAT at the time was um, I thought it would be a way to figure out some possibilities the first time I attended and to find out uh, some projects where I could do sort of longer term observations. That's classically what ethnographers do. They try to immerse themselves in a particular uh, uh, kind of culture and that culture can be, for instance, a scientific lab. Um, and I thought, okay, I just have to identify a few places that I can go to watch sonifications being made. And therefore, I would learn something about the everyday life of sonification. Um, that never really quite happened, um, uh, in the sense that I also learned that there weren't that many projects that were really uh, sustained uh, sonification projects where you could go anytime and you could be sure that you'd be watching sonifications uh, happen because it turned out a lot of people were actually balancing sonification work with all sorts of other work uh, which to some extent seemed to teach us something about the sonification community but also I think teaches us a lot about uh, 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 the, the research system at large as well that it's uh, quite fragmented and it's quite difficult to really make space uh, for concentrating on one thing. So instead I ended up doing a more multi-sited ethnography of really going into a lots, lots of different spaces but uh, for shorter term observations. And the conferences ended up being a really important part of that, but also various workshops. I also spent uh, two weeks in Bielefeld uh, learning a little bit of sonification uh, from uh, the expert guidance of Thomas Herrmann. Um, you're going to hear a little bit about that later as well, I can already tell you. Um, so basically I, was, uh, I spent a few years immersing myself as well as I could in the sonification community, also doing interviews with quite a few practitioners and analyzing documents and publications. And I thought, seeing as this is the 25th conference, I thought it might be nice um, uh, to focus the talk mostly on what the conferences can teach us about sonification. Um, and I'm going to talk about three different sort of functions or uh, uh, roles that conferences can have and, and talk about them through three specific snapshots as well. So I'm going to give you some snapshots of the everyday life of sonification. But I also thought, uh, before I do that, it might be useful to give you a little bit more background and context for why I was interested in studying this community to begin with. I know many of us have quite idiosyncratic and unusual kind of stories of how we got involved in sonification, and um, so is mine, I think. My background is really um, in the fields of science and technology studies and sociology. Um, uh, so basically a field uh, that is very much interested in trying to understand interactions between science, technology and society. And interactions then not just in the sense of, ah, here's a scientific development, what is its, uh, uh, how does it affect society, what are its implications, what is its societal impact, but rather in the sense of trying to understand how science, technology and society really shape each other. So for instance, things such as what are the cultural <laughs> factors, the historical contingencies, and um, uh, the kind of uh, societal um, um, interests that shape what we regard as scientific research in the first place. Um, 
And I came to that field, which is itself also an interdisciplinary field, uh, through a study of sociology in the first place. Uh, both of my uh, PhD advisors were actually historians of science and technology, and I remember that some of the useful advice that I got from them early on was, if you introduce yourself to people in this community, don't say you're a sociologist, that's threatening. <laughs> Just call yourself a historian. <laughs> um, <laughs> I seem to recall that I didn't completely follow up on that, but if some of you have good email archives, you might, you might see what, uh, when the sort of breaking point was. Um, but in any case, I never really had the impression that people found me particularly threatening, uh, which was nice. Um, I was welcomed with open arms, was my overall impression. Um, the reason I was interested in sonification uh, was uh, basically as a case study of how interdisciplinarity, interdisciplinary communities kind of take shape, how they take form, uh, how they uh, emerge and then consolidate. And I was particularly interested in a case where people were trying to work with sound as a way of doing scientific research. Uh, I was interested in things such as the strategies of legitimation, so how to uh, establish sonification as something that has scientific legitimacy, the kind of notions of objectivity that were developed in order to, uh, to be able to support uh, uh, these uh, strategies the kind of wider questions that this opened up about uh, auditory and visual representations in scientific practice, and of course very much this, uh, because I was interested in interdisciplinary communities, this idea of what does that teach us about, uh, for instance, the boundaries between science and art, but also the boundaries between different uh, disciplines within the community. How are these boundaries negotiated? Uh, um, and I was also interested in what are the kind of bodily and sensory skills that you need to make something like sonification uh, work. Uh, so those were the, some of the kinds of things that I was interested in. The, what I probably took as the main uh, kind of takeaway message was that there were lots of really interesting negotiation processes going on within sonification. Uh, a lot of balancing acts going on between getting different things together. Um, including, and this is what the subtitle of my, of my dissertation then alluded to in the end, the idea that there are different discourses around sonification, some of them that are targeted primarily at getting a sort of sense of public fascination with the phenomenon, trying to appeal to a wider public, and some of them that are more about establishing it as a scientifically legitimate technique, and that in the way that these different uh, narratives were framed, um, there was actually some tension emerging. Um, so, so that, I think, was the sort of takeaway message from all this, uh, if I had to pick one. But it's not what I'm going to focus the talk about today, because I said I would talk about the conferences, and uh, it plays into that sort of wider phenomenon. Um, uh, but um, I'm interested specifically in what do conferences do. I'm going to bracket one thing that conferences also do, which is that uh, we go to conferences, we learn about new research that is happening, uh, we learn something from the content of the talks. Um, that is something that, of course, is uh, that's part of the motivation for going to conferences, that's certainly part of the motivation for funding conferences. Um, that is also something that um, uh, scholars in uh, fields like science and technology studies, anthropology of science, when they have looked at conferences, they have argued generally it's the least important part of what happens at conferences. It's uh, more the networking, it's more the kind of informal conversations, it's more the sense of community being uh, 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 created. Um, there's one quote by a, a sociologist of science, Harry Collins, who basically says, the stuff that happens in the talks isn't important. What, ha what matters at conferences is what happens in the corridors. That, I think, is slightly, um, slightly exaggerated. It's, I think it makes perhaps too much of a dichotomy between what happens in the conference room and what happens in the corridors. I think there's a lot of interaction. First of all, of course, it gives you something to talk about uh, in the corridors, but also a lot of the kind of things that people talk about when they say, this is important, it's in the corridors, ah, that's the kind of eye contact, that's the sense of kind of two people relating with each other or more people relating with each other. A lot of that can also happen um, in uh, uh, the, the, the actual sessions. Um, but in any case, conferences are usually set up to kind of make a balance of these, these things happen. 
And of course, in the sense of ICAT, we see that uh, reflected in the program, in the kind of outings that take place, the concerts, uh, the jam sessions, um, and, and things like that. The algo rave, um, apparently, as a new feature this time. Um, so um, those are some of, the, uh, some of the things that basically make sure that uh, a sense of community is being cultivated. Also that people who are new to the community can sort of be integrated within it, can sort of learn some of the norms and values of that community. Um, and that goes in hand, I think, hand in hand, I think also uh, with the idea that there is such a thing as carrying yourself as a member of a community that you do in the corridors, but also in the conference hall. Um, Charles Goodwin has talked about the perceptual standards that define a community of competent practitioners. And similarly, I was interested in what could those perceptual standards that a community like ICAT shares, or at least aims to share, what might they be? Um, and um, one thing that I stumbled upon and, and that, I, uh, that I was fascinated Perhaps I was initially fascinated in part because um, some of you, and I don't know who gets the initial credit for that, but some of you gave it such a catchy uh, name, uh, the practice of data karaoke. Uh, I feel like I first heard it from you, Thomas, but I don't know if you, uh, if, if, if you came up with it. But whoever, whoever came up with it, I think, uh, deserves a lot of uh, credit uh, for this wonderfully catchy name uh, for the idea that basically one of the ways in which you can sort of engage with sound is uh, through your own body, through using your own voice in order uh, uh, to communicate um, uh, um, with a wider audience. And I've witnessed a few instances of that in various uh, uh, kind of uh, practices related to sonification, but one of them being uh, during presentations at conferences. Um, so there's a few uh, quotes that I, that I have, I've included two of them on my slides as well, of how uh, speakers have been sort of making use of that practice in different kinds of configurations, often in combination with playing back uh, an, a sound file, uh, but then also singing the same sound with their own voice. Um, so the two examples that are up there on the slide are on the one hand, uh, the example of someone <laughs> Uh, first playing a sound file, then mimicking what was just heard, basically recreating it with their own voice um, uh, in order to draw attention to particular elements um, and then playing the same sound again. So this is almost like a sort of tutorial for what you're hearing in it. Another one uh, basically first uh, sang and then played the sound file that was going to be heard and in doing so uh, also gesticulated along with what was being heard. Um, so there's a couple of things that are obviously happening in these examples. Uh, it's a form of illustration of what you're hearing. It's also a form of highlighting. It draws attention to elements that are salient in what you're hearing, because in recreating what is in your own voice, you always emphasize some elements of that sound over others. Uh, you, never, you never fully capture everything that is in the sound file, but rather you recreate those elements that are most important. Um, so those are two things that are obviously happening. Um, but there's a couple of other things that I thought, uh, the more I thought about it, the, the more I thought these are also happening. One of them is a sense of embodiment. Um, I was reminded here of the work um, by an anthropologist of science, Natasha Myers, who has worked uh, a lot about uh, protein crystallography and about the way that uh, basically um, uh, people make models uh, of these proteins and in doing so often use their own body to kind of model what a protein uh, looks like and is structured like. And, um, and um, in doing so, Myers argues they are able to kind of uh, create a, an embodied relationship with, uh, uh, with those structures um, that allow them a much deeper understanding of, uh, of the structures than simply, for instance, uh, letting them be visualized. Uh, would. And I thought something like that is happening as well when someone is singing a data set. This is particularly true when they are trying to sort of sketch out what a data set might, look, might sound like eventually. But I think even in a case where the sound file is already there and it's being recreated for demonstration purposes, um, something like that happens as well. And not only is the speaker then using their own voice to create a relationship with the sound um, that they're playing, but also they're inviting the audience uh, to be part of that 
embodied relationship as well. Um, so that's part of it, I think. The other part I thought I could detect was that it also has something to do with the transfer of scientific authority between the sound and the speaker. And I think it can go in both directions. Um, uh, in, a, in a way, uh, you're, you're making yourself one with it, so whatever scientific authority you inhabit can also transfer on uh, to the sound, but on the other way, you might gain some uh, by recreating the sound. I think part of the reason I thought of that was in part because I was so much in awe at the fact that people were willing to stand up there and just start singing a data set because I felt like I would be awfully self-conscious doing that. Um, so in a way it seems like an exhibition of authority as well, um, probably not consciously so, um, but I, I, I felt like it might have that effect and it, it would, reminded me of some interesting work that's uh, been done by, for instance, the sociologist Irving Goffman who has written about um, authority, the, the, the embodiment of the performance of authority in lectures, um, but also um, William Clark, I think is his first name, uh, who is, is a historian of science who's written about um, the construction of a professorial voice um, um, as, a, as a sort of historical case and, and this idea that the voice of the, of the professor is of relevance. Um, both of these examples um, work for sure uh, with uh, male professors as the starting point. And I wasn't entirely sure whether, whether this was, um, whether I could draw really firm conclusions for that, but I did notice it was usually men who were, who were doing this on the stage at ICAT as well. Um, I also heard more male speakers than female speakers. I also found that it was more likely to be people who had been in the community for some time than people who had just uh, arrived for the first time. Um, but um, that, that might potentially also hint at a gendered dimension of scientific authority. Just as I was starting to think about that, I had the impression that people within the ICAT community were also starting to think about uh, uh, the sort of gendered uh, practices of uh, conferences as well. Um, but again, I, I didn't systematically enough uh, count instances of data karaoke to be absolutely sure. The fifth function I think that this practice potentially has uh, is that of integration uh, between uh, different channels. It's uh, traditionally uh, one of the arguments uh, being made for uh, why, uh, uh, why sound uh, has been slightly marginalized uh, in relationship to something like graphs, for instance, is the idea that graphs and other forms of visual representation can very easily be circulated via print. Um, so they can function as uh, what uh, Bruno Latour calls as inscriptions that can travel very easily from one context to another. Um, and sound, um, certainly in print, cannot do that quite as easily. You need to sort of work around it in some ways. In the, uh, in the forum of a spoken presentation, of course, it is much easier to, uh, to integrate your voice using it for non-speech purposes along with using it to speak about your research. So there's that element of integration going on that you can very easily and quite in, in quite a foolproof manner uh, in the sense that um, there's no, uh, no, da no great danger of your sound file having been lost or corrupted or damaged along the way. You can just rely upon your voice to recreate some of those sounds. Um, so in that sense, it's easily integrated in the, in the genre of an um, academic presentation. The other way in which it allows integration is um, that in these examples um, that I was speaking about where someone is using their voice to recreate a data set, the sounds of a data set, um, is that it uh, also involves the integration uh, between the sense of hearing uh, the sense of seeing, because there's usually still some kind of uh, visual support going on, but also uh, a, a more tactile form of representation as you're feeling it in your own body. Um, so I thought that was quite an interesting uh, thing that I, that I learned at ICAT, uh, what, uh, what kind of uh, presentation techniques can be used to sort of support, um, uh, uh, to support uh, the process of uh, communicating um, 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 uh, scientific knowledge, essentially, uh, or research. Um, so that's, uh, that's uh, and in, in doing so, it's part of that set of professional skills um, that are being developed within the ICAT community um, that are quite, quite a different set of uh, professional skills 
And then, for instance, if I go to conferences in the field of science and technology studies, where it's quite rare for people to start singing, actually. Um, <laughs> which might be part of my self-conscious about it as well, of course. Um, anyway, so that's the, the first uh, uh, role and function of conferences that I wanted to talk about. Uh, the second one is that conferences are a fantastic space uh, to watch the deliberations about the kind of status of sonification. Uh, that's this question of scientific legitimacy that I was uh, bringing up early on. Uh, uh, basically, uh, I witnessed all sorts of interesting debates about um, the status of sonification and most specifically in relation to what the relationship between sonification and visualization should be. Um, is visualization more of a competitor for sonification? That is the reason why sound has been marginalized? Or is it more of a role model or an alley that you can sort of draw upon in order to uh, also um, push for more use of, the, of, of sound? And um, these kind of debates, of course, happen in a lot of sonification publications. In the conferences, uh, they also often happen in relation to discussions about what forms of representation people should use to support <coughs> their talks. To what extent there should be graphs, for instance, supporting uh, the talk about um, uh, uh, sonification, and to what extent it is necessary uh, for a presentation at ICAST to also include non-speech uh, sound along with someone talking about their research. Um, and as I was preparing uh, uh, for the uh, presentation uh, today for, for this lecture. Um, uh, there was a lovely email from Paul instructing authors, uh, presenters on uh, how to, what kind of technical setup was there, uh, but also including some reminders on the use of sound. Um, and it reminded me uh, a, a little bit of, um, it was like a more subtle form of uh, something that I had seen in a previous call for paper for ICAT, uh, where the call for paper basically uh, urged authors uh, to consider how they can incorporate auditory display into the presentation of their papers. For instance, by including auditory annotations and examples of the sounds used in their efforts and or by sonifying their results. Um, just as it would be unusual for presentations of papers on graphics not to include some visual artifacts, we are aiming for it to be the norm that ICAT paper presentations employ sound in addition to the voice of the speaker. Uh, this was for uh, ICAT 2010, I think. Um, and um, uh, I, I, think, I thought it was a really, really interesting quote because it encapsulates so much of these discussions and uh, um, because it, um, it so explicitly basically invited authors to think about this as something of a responsibility um, to the community <coughs> as well. And once again, uh, this relationship between sonification and visualization is used here in that kind of role model uh, uh, sort of um, uh, sense. Um, this year there weren't uh, as explicit instructions as that, but there was first of all a reminder of what kind of audio equipment might be, uh, uh, would be present. And on the other hand, um, the note that there would be an award for the best uh, use of sound, which started with, uh, since many papers include uh, non-speech uh, sound, um, uh, it, it's interesting for you to know that we're also going to give an award for the best one. Uh, so it's a very different way of uh, kind of reminding authors of this, um, uh, and I think it shows sort of different ways of, of approaching it. But both of them are part of these kind of formal and informal uh, ways that have been found within the community to basically stimulate the use of non-speech sound at conferences. And as I was thinking about that again, I was starting to feel a little bit guilty because really I wasn't planning to bring any non-speech sound. It always feels slightly, when I talk about sonification to people who don't know what sonification is, I always make sure to bring some examples, but they're never my own example. And uh, of course, uh, you know a lot about what sonification is. You've heard some really great examples. You've made some really great examples. So it will always seem slightly parasitic to then bring someone else's uh, example. Um, but at the same time, I felt like, well, clearly this is a sometimes very outspoken and sometimes more subtly hinted at a convention at the community that it's appreciated when you bring some sounds. And so I was thinking, what could I possibly bring? And then I remembered back that uh, in those two weeks that I spent with uh, Thomas in Bielefeld learning sonification, I soaked up a lot of what it means uh, 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 to do sonification, 
And part of the reason I, I soaked up so much was that I was actually trying to learn to sonify myself. So I had to go looking, do I still have some of those sound files that I hadn't listened to in about 10 years, I'm afraid to say. But it turns out I did. Um, and so I thought, okay, I'll bring you, I'll bring you some sound examples. Um, they were my attempts to try to learn how to do sonification myself practically. Uh, with a lot of very patient guidance uh, from Thomas, uh, for sure, and from other people in his uh, research group. And I thought, okay, I'll just play you these. Um, I had to look up in my dissertation what exactly was I, was I trying to do with these. Um, they were, the starting point of them was to basically do something like an auditory form of a, a box plot. Um, of descriptive scientific data. So basically, you have a data set and you're trying to, uh, 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 to uh, uh, communicate something about things like standard deviation, mean, um, the sort of um, spread of data within that set. <coughs> and uh, so we did some of those. I know that Thomas is very curious to hear this because you haven't heard them even longer than I have. Um, um, I looked up what we were trying to do there. Um, I, I still don't really feel entirely comfortable explaining to you what you're what you're hearing in these, but you are hearing two different um, two different data sets. One of them showing a uniform distribution. And the other one a bimodal one. Yeah, so I looked up in my dissertation what, what, were it, what were all these different sounds in there and I could partially try to sort of reconstruct it but in the end I think it doesn't really matter so much because I think what you're hearing here is more my learning process to become uh, something that you might consider an incompet incompetent technician of uh, sonification uh, or programmer, uh, uh, designer, uh, whatever the technician is, the term used by Latour and Wulgar. Uh, in uh, a very uh, classic study in my field of science and technology studies um, called Laboratory Life. Uh, it was uh, published in the late 70s and was one of the first uh, efforts to basically uh, study a scientific laboratory from within uh, <coughs> as an embedded ethnographer who's uh, trying to understand a little bit like usually anthropologists go to study foreign tribes uh, in faraway cultures and they did that for uh, uh, the Salk Institute, and um, part of what uh, uh, part of what uh, they learned from was this idea of trying to support uh, uh, the research process, basically some of the experiments by acting as technicians. Um, but then what they found is that actually um, they didn't really have the skills to do that very well. Um, but in trying to do it anyway, they learned a lot about the things that are usually kind of taken for granted skills. And uh, it's, it's always much easier to find out what skills are needed for something if you don't have them. Uh, so in that sense, um, uh, trying to spend two, two weeks as someone who had never done any programming, who had very little musical background, just trying to, to do some descriptive statistics sonification with Super Collider taught me a whole lot about what it is that, that you need to know to do sonifications. What are the things that you uh, sort of have to pay attention to? And I think that's, in a way, what you're hearing. Uh, in the fact that you hear anything at all in those is because uh, occasionally Thomas came by to clean up my code. Um, and that's why, that's why then it was possible to create any kind of sounds at all. Uh, uh, but still, I think you're hearing a sonification of my learning process more than a sonification of uh, descriptive statistics. But I have managed to include some non-speech audio uh, in my sonification. I was full of the best intentions when I came back that I would really put these skills to the, uh, 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 to the use, by the way, and that I would become a slightly less incompetent uh, uh, sonification designer. But I have to admit, it never actually happened. But I learned a lot in those two weeks. Um, so um, that's a slight um, detour, perhaps, from what I was talking about in terms of the function of conferences. But it does tell us something about the kind of standards of a community and the, the negotiations about uh, what are acceptable forms of representation. 
Um, the third uh, function of conferences uh, that I want to talk about is uh, the role of conferences as a site for negotiating and delineating the boundaries of the sonification community. Um, there's a lot of that that's quite explicit in some of the papers, in some of the proceedings from these conferences as well, about um, how should we define zonification, what should be included in this field, what shouldn't be included, to what extent, for instance, is art part of the field of zonification research or not. Um, so in that sense, um, that was partly a matter of simply listening to what people were saying during their talks. Um, the other part of the story that I heard was also in interviews uh, uh, with uh, members of this community, the kind of uh, more backstage discussions about what the appropriate standards for peer review uh, uh, should be. For instance, to what extent uh, things like having done an evaluation or a user test of a sonification should be a requirement uh, to be part uh, of this conference. Um, so. Um, this, this kind of negotiation processes within the community is something that I was very much interested in uh, sketching in my dissertation. I won't be able to go into too much uh, detail on the sort of nature of the different arguments for why sonification should be defined in this way or in that way. Um, I think you're also aware of, uh, of uh, quite a few of them anyway. Um, uh, but I, I did find it interesting that the conference is such an important place for these discussions uh, to happen and this kind of calibration of what uh, uh, good sonification research means uh, uh, to happen as well. Um, so, um, so that's basically this third element of what conferences do, not just for sonification of course, but more generally, especially I think for interdisciplinary fields, especially for young fields of research, uh, there's often a lot of very explicit discussion about what is or what isn't uh, part of a field. And um, conferences, because you have so many people coming together to exchange these, are a great site for that. And therefore, they're also a great uh, site for an ethnography, ethnographer trying to understand um, these debates. Um, so a lot of that is very much explicit. And um, the, the final snapshot that I want, want to give you is more about the more implicit ways in which these uh, uh, boundaries are also being defined. And that is uh, through basically uh, uh, sketching a history of a community, uh, a sort of approaches to how far back to go, and discussions about whether, for instance, uh, uh, um, um, examples of medical listening uh, through percussion or through the stethoscope, to what extent that should be used as a precursor for sonification, to what extent the Geiger counter should be used as an example for that. Because basically, as a term, sonification isn't really that old, but of course there are examples going back a lot longer uh, of people using sound uh, to communicate data. And this relationship between how you define uh, uh, what sonification is and what then becomes part of the history of sonification research uh, was uh, quite an interesting one, I thought. And um, as I mentioned, I found sort of different ways of doing that and different ideas of how far back to go and how broadly or how narrowly uh, to define the idea of a precursor to sonification. But what I found as a fairly uniform narrative, uh, both in interviews and in publications that I analyzed, is the idea that the sonification community has a sort of birth date an official moment where it was started. I've included one uh, quote here from Alberto de Campos' dissertation where, uh, where he makes that point quite explicitly. Uh, the history of sonification research officially began with the first international conference for auditory display in 1992, organized by Gregory Kramer to bring all the researchers working on related topics, but largely unaware of each other, into one research community. So kind of like snip of the fingers and you have a community. Um, which um, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make fun of that. I, I think this is, uh, uh, of course, precisely the kind of function that these sort of historical uh, uh, narratives uh, have. Um, but of course, you could tell that in different ways. Um, because some of these people were already aware of each other. And um, some of them who might have been working on related topics uh, did not become part of the community either. Um, so in that sense, uh, it's a very clear-cut story that also makes a lot of sense, uh, uh, but as it's still, it's, it's, it's a choice being made about how to narrate uh, 
uh, this community that could also be uh, told differently. And all of these stories also um, kind of have this uh, uh, other narrative of Gregory Kramer as something of a founding father to the community. And um, I've also interviewed Gregory Kramer, and he was very explicitly talking about it as an, uh, uh, as an explicit um, uh, intention to really create a new field. And you can, you can see that in the title, uh, the, the first international uh, conference on auditory display. Uh, you can see that in the book that was published uh, based on the proceedings. Uh, took two years uh, uh, to produce because not only did it collect uh, the different um, uh, papers that were presented there, but it had a very, very lengthy introduction by uh, Gregory Kramer trying to create some sense of shared terminology and also um, uh, actually also creating a kind of history for sonification. Um, so you can really see that this is very explicitly intended to kind of create a community and it was successful as we can see by the fact that we're all here now, uh, 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 which is nice. But I think it's interesting uh, to think about how then these decisions uh, made also influenced what kind of community it would uh, become. Uh, so Gregory Kramer's uh, stated intention was um, a desire to use the tools of electronic music uh, to understand complex phenomena. And um, in a way, I think that reverberates back in, uh, in some of the work of the community as well. Um, so uh, that is my kind of more conceptual point here that these, um, there's nothing uh, historically wrong with, uh, with the kind of story being told here at all. But it's also interesting to think about what kind of narratives about a community, what kind of shaping function do they have for what a community is today. And that, again, of course, is not um, something that is true only for sonification research, but that is very much true whenever, uh, for instance, scientific, um, 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 scientific organizations celebrate their 100 years of existence, 50 years of existence. There's usually different ways of counting, basically, at, at stake as well. Um, so this, uh, this legitimizing function that a story about the community has is something I'm interested in as well. Uh, that was uh, already, basically, in a nutshell, uh, uh, my, my story. So I didn't really tell you what the everyday life of sonification is, I'm afraid. Um, except that it is quite a fragmented affair, as you all, I think, know. And again, uh, we can exchange stories on that uh, later. But what I have uh, tried, to, um, uh, tried to argue uh, in uh, this talk is that paying attention to the conferences as also social events, um, as uh, places where debates happen, as uh, uh, places where a kind of uh, uh, way of presenting research uh, is being performed uh, uh, basically gives us a sense of what kind of uh, community this is. So I've had these three different layers of the talk, uh, how the social identity and professional skills are cultivated, how the status of sonification is deliberated, and how the boundaries of what the community are and should be are negotiated. And um, these three, three things together, I think, also tell us something about what kind of community ICAD is. Um, I'm sure there's lots of things what can say, can say about ICAD. I haven't put the fact that it's a very friendly and welcoming community on the slide, so that is something that is definitely uh, uh, there as well. Uh, but some of the things that I did find uh, striking about my observations of ICAD is that here we have a community that continually reasserts uh, the value of sound and the value of listening and what the ear is capable of doing. Um, there's a very high tendency to sort of engage in programmatic discussions um, and to sort of uh, continually also question the basis of uh, 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 one's own approaches, uh, which I think is really, really interesting. It, it makes the job of an ethnographer actually extremely easy because you're wearing it. Uh, a lot of, usually as an ethnographer, you try to sort of uh, study the unspoken assumptions that exist within a field. Um, I haven't really found too many of those because actually uh, they're so outspoken all, all the time that I, I feel like in, in my research I've been able to maybe provide a little bit more uh, context to some of them, to show a little bit more how, how they are negotiated. But in the end, I think the, the actual uh, assumptions that are there are ones that I've had the impression um, uh, within uh, the sonification community people are actually quite aware of. 
in part because it's such an interdisciplinary community that uh, uh, you have to negotiate them all the time. And um, the other part is uh, notwithstanding these examples of how, uh, how people use their voices, for instance, uh, uh, to draw attention uh, uh, to particular elements uh, in sonifications, on the whole, my impression of ICAD is uh, a community that is more driven by wanting to understand something about tools and about designs and about optimal designs uh, rather than uh, uh, that uh, there's a lot of very in-depth discussion uh, going on about how to interpret certain kinds of sonification. And of course, that's very much what I did with my, my own example as well, uh, but I still thought it might be an interesting one uh, to reflect upon. Yeah, um, that's it from me, and I'm very curious to hear what kind of questions, remarks and comments you have. Thank you for a great uh, discussion related to the sonification. So this is second time to attend this conference. So my question is, uh, what will be the uh, killer app of sonification? <laughs> <laughs> it's my first time in quite a few years that I've been here. So I, I feel like uh, other people in the room are more likely to have accurate predictions of it. Um, um, I wouldn't know, but I'm very curious to find out. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that I, that I have, uh, uh, th yeah, I, I don't think that uh, uh, that being uh, a scholar in science and technology studies or in sociology in any way uh, uh, kind of qualifies me to make that kind of, of prediction. Um, but uh, one of the, one of the uh, things that I was curious about coming back, uh, because I mentioned I was here for the first time in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, 2008, and then I came a few times in a row to these conferences, and um, this, uh, I don't know if you're explicitly referring to it, but actually the first paper I wrote about sonification was about this idea that it's a community searching for a killer app. Um, and um, that was then 2008, 2009. I'm not aware that it has been found yet, but perhaps, perhaps it will be found at this conference, I don't know. But I think I'm in no better position uh, than you or anyone else in the room to, to say what it will be. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your presentation. I just, was, I just had a question. Are there any other kind of fields of study that you've um, examined or studied that you can kind of tell of any kind of stark contrasts that makes sonification different as a field of study or as a community? Um, so I haven't, I haven't studied another community quite as much in depth as I have uh, uh, sonification, actually. So uh, my, my dissertation was really just about... Uh, oh yeah. Uh, um, just about uh, sonification. Um, I've drawn uh, some parallels al along the way, mostly based on the work of other scholars. I have in the meantime also been uh, uh, thinking part of the reason I was talking about conferences, it did feel appropriate uh, uh, to the invitation, but the other part of it is that's something I'm quite interested in myself as well, <laughs> I have to admit. Um, and I have uh, uh, sort of done some exploratory research at other kinds of workshops and conferences at, at other communities. Um, uh, certainly the, the centrality of sound and listening <laughs> obviously uh, is uh, the least surprising uh, uh, part of it. I do think that the fact that um, um, perhaps even compared to, but the, the other, uh, the other uh, workshops and communities I've studied haven't been as highly interdisciplinary. Um, uh, but certainly uh, what I hinted at at the end is sort of continually sort of questioning each other's assumptions uh, uh, to some extent. This kind of very strong problem, problematic discussions is something that does strike me as quite, um, quite unique uh, uh, to sonification, but probably also to other interdisciplinary fields. Um, so I, I was thinking it would be quite interesting to do similar kinds of studies of other highly interdisciplinary uh, uh, communities, um, but I haven't done it yet, and um, I, I also don't know of anything that is quite as uh, sort of 
uh, completely comparable um, 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 sort of uh, piece of work uh, in that way. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a really, really uh, um, interesting question because, of course, to some extent, uh, the, the different functions of, of conferences, for instance, I think this is something you're going to find in some way or another uh, for other communities as well. And um, I, that's something that's certainly supported by existing research, and that's something that I've observed at other conferences uh, uh, that I've uh, attended. I think it's more the way that this is being filled in than in, in, in practice, so the way that boundaries are being drawn, the kinds of negotiations that are being uh, that are happening. So certainly um, so much attention uh, to discussions about what is an adequate form of representation uh, at conferences. I think that is something that is quite unusual and that is precisely what drew me to this community in the first place, this idea that, oh, we can, we can put question marks um, uh, around the idea that there is like one way of representing scientific data. Hi. Um... <laughs> as somebody who's been involved in this community for a very, very long time, not quite as long as Matty, but uh, <laughs> it really has it on all of us, um, I've really always been wowed by your work. Um, I think you gave us an absolutely amazing set of insights into who we are and what we do. And um, uh, I, I actually have gone back and read some of your work over again a second time just to, to sort of, you know, and, and new things are revealed in it. But my question is kind of um, a reflective question, uh, and this may sound a little odd to you. Obviously, you're a member of a community of like-minded researchers yourself, and I'm kind of interested in knowing how what you've observed about our community has been received by your community. Um, th thanks a lot. Also, I mean, it's 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 really encouraging to hear that because one of the uh, uh, one of the worst things that can happen when you write a dissertation like that is to have or work like that is to sort of have it be not recognizable at all by the community that you're studying. Sometimes there can be potentially a sort of confronting insights, and there can be good explanations for that, but if, if it doesn't depict the reality that you're trying to describe at all, then something clearly fundamentally went wrong. So it's really reassuring to hear that uh, from people like, like you, Derek. Uh, in terms of how it's been uh, received, um, I. So, so um, I, I think people have sort of linked up to it in lots of uh, sort of different ways, um, uh, uh, but um, certainly it starts with as a bit of a sense of curiosity. I have to, I have to admit. So, uh, also uh, something like uh, so a lot of the questions that I get when I present to my own uh, uh, community, and I also when I come here, I feel like part of this community too. But when I present at a science and technology studies conference. Uh, a lot of the questions are actually along the lines of, oh, and I've heard of this other thing here, would that be considered a form of, of sonification? Uh, which I find really interesting coming uh, uh, from scholars in science and technology studies, because these are usually people uh, that in their own work, uh, they sort of would question the idea that something either straightforwardly is or is not an example of something else, but rather they would, and, and I usually tell this as a story of negotiations of how something is or isn't a, a, a sonification, and then to immediately afterwards get a question of, okay, I've heard this example here. Is that part of sonification? Is that, in the best case, is it part of the community? But sometimes it's really just straight up, oh, uh, so would that be part of what you're looking at? And that's the most disappointing question, actually, I can get, because in a way, um, uh, in a way, uh, it doesn't really engage with the argument. And it, uh, um, but at the same time, I've started to accept it as something uh, that there's something perhaps slightly confronting happening for the science and technology studies community, which is also a kind of interdisciplinary community that also forms its particular traditions and narratives of uh, uh, what is part of its. Uh, 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 what, if, what is part of its community and what is not. So, in a way, um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that I can completely uh, uh, um, sort of finish that thought now. But, um, uh, yeah, so, so I think that's the most interesting thing, that people end up becoming fairly... People who are not essentialistic in their own research end up becoming slightly essentialistic about what sonification is or isn't. 
Um, so I think perhaps there is a particular power of sonification to make people question their assumptions, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Um, just a, a comment to the room first. If you haven't read any of Alexandra's work, I really encourage you to, <clears throat> not least because she's one of the best writers of English I've come across as well. You, your writing is really top notch. Um, very easy to read, but in, in a good way, not, not, a, not a comic strip way. <laughs> Thank you. Very elegant writing. Um, Alexandra, I was very struck by your observation that you see us as very tool and design driven and much less interpretation driven. And I was just wondering what you thought of that. Do you find that as odd? I think it's not particularly odd because mm. by, uh, I, I think it has to do with who is coming together in a room like that, right? I mean, the, the tools are the things that you're most likely to have in common or that you're most likely uh, to learn from each other. Um, uh, so in that sense, I, I think it's, it's, it's not odd, but at the same time, it's also something that I've heard from uh, a lot of people within the community also, um, that perhaps what the, what the community needs is also more sustained listening. Um, and so in that sense, um, uh, it's not odd. I think there are very, very clear explanations to be, to be given in terms of who comes and uh, what you can learn from each other about. Uh, uh, but, I don't know, is it helpful? And I'm not saying it's not helpful, because I think you can, uh, 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 you can obviously learn from each other, but would it also be interesting to, uh, 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 to create more space for this kind of sustained listening? Well, yeah, and now to some extent you're doing that as well, you're trying to do... That's well, right, because I thought, given that the whole point of sonification is to make data apprehensible, the fact that you have observed us as actually not really spending as much of our time focusing on that experien experiential aspect of sonification is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Maybe something for us to think about. So yeah, you. I mean, that's a, that's a sort of a, another kind of balancing act. I think that has a lot to do with the format of these kind of presentations, uh, uh, because they have a very strict timeline and you have to explain something about what is being heard there. So you don't end up having that much time there. Uh, so I think there's a lot to be said for single track conferences uh, in terms of making sure everyone is part of the same communica uh, community uh, co conversation, um, but at the same time it has its downsides too. Hi, Alexander. I think I've had a similar profile to you in terms of my attendance at ICAD. I started coming around the same time and then there was a big gap where I didn't come. But one thing that I, I, I noticed when I first started coming was that it, it, was, it was kind of less like an interdisciplinary, one interdisciplinary community and more like sub sub communities of they're doing very different things like mm -hmm. in the at least in the beginning there seemed to be quite a sharp divide between the people that were doing sonification and the people that were doing more kind of assistive devices type um, user-based research so there's sort of this scientific data sonification kind of group and I don't that was just my perception I may have got gotten that all wrong but I didn't hear you talk about anything like that like the way that the community not only was functioning interdisciplinarily but also sometimes quite quite separate in their mm -hmm. activities and in their sub communities yeah, that's a, that's a good point, and I think that's something that I, I actually should have been a disclaimer uh, uh, right at the start, I think, uh, because I came I came to the ICAT community with an interest in data sonification. Um, so in that sense, I was always uh, paying slightly more attention, perhaps, to some sub-communities than others. Um, at the same time, I did think that there were also negotiations happening across these communities. Um, and I, I didn't have the impression that it's a sort of completely like, okay, this is a different kind of thing, so I entirely stopped listening now. And, and so in that, which is something that I, and I think that is then one of the strengths of a single track conference, actually, uh, that if you did away with that and said, okay, we have parallel tracks and we spend a lot more on each presentation, um, I think you would really see that some people would gravitate more towards some sessions and more towards others. And so I think to some extent I, I recognize what you're saying, uh, uh, but at the same time I, I, I think compared to maybe some other uh, uh, conferences that I've been part of, actually 
there's still been a sort of shared conversation happening nonetheless. Um, so actually when I go to science and technology studies conferences that are very large, um, um, there you really see some of the, uh, it's a huge conference and I see the same people all the time mm -hmm. in the same session. So, so in that sense, uh, I actually think compared to some other communities uh, that are interdisciplinary, that might be um, also limited, but at the same time it's true that it's still happening for sure. Okay, it's time to thank.